When I was first acquainted with the Diadophus punctatus, there were many facts of her continents that raised an embarrassing total of questions in my mind. Why, for instance, does she share a resemblance to the western hognose? Not on a superficial level, mind you. No, Diadophus looks about as far from a hognose as a rear-fanged colubra native to North America that feeds on frogs and plays dead when threatened can look. Pay extra attention to what I've just relayed to you. Think about an aspect of the western hognose that sets them apart from other colubrids, or even other snakes for that matter. Diadophus serves a ham-fisted mimicry of hognoses, one that is so aggravatingly glossed over in every noteworthy documentation that I could just not keep myself from holding it from you. They play dead, they eat frogs, they're rear fanged, they develop a resistance to frog poison, they corkscrew their tail, but they're also communal. They also, like many reptiles, secrete pheromones. Truly, Diadophus is more than just a coincidental copy of Hognosis. And how did this strange flick of convergent evolution come to be, exactly? Convergent evolution b being the phenomenon of unrelated species evolving similar traits. It's likely this is the case. After all, the similarities end where the tip of her nose begins. Truly, they look nothing alike. Diadophus possesses a sheen to their scales reminiscent of grey lead paint, with a shiny vermilion band sealing its neck. Western hognoses carry a color palette no less striking in my eyes, more akin to a cafe at noon, with speckles dotting its dorsal like splatters of coffee. If I may mention, and this carries no scientific grounds, weight, or relevance at all, but the continents of Diadophus carries the synesthetic taste of metal, like licking a pole or a penny. The western hognose's scale coloration, however, has the taste of chai on milk. And I just thought that was interesting. Welcome to Herp Corner, the series where we delve into the ins and outs of some of the more exceptionally weird species of reptiles and amphibians. I'm your host for today, Baphomet, and today we're talking about the ringneck snake, or as I refer to her, Diadophus punctatus. Diadophus holds its place in a very specific ecological slot. One that demands a population control for frogs, small snakes, salamanders, earthworms, slugs, and small lizards. The various watchful eyes that track the dietary patterns of Diadophus each report a lack of preference between its many dinner options. She rather favors whatever is most common locally rather than what tastes best. Of course, as a mammalian species, we have no real method of measuring her tastes other than the patterns that might arise if one prefers one prey item from another. A snake, after all, is so divorced from an ape that the species she consumes on a regular, including the very poisonous frogs, Rana lithobates, Anaxurus americanus, and Anaxurus boreas, may carry a flavor to her of Thanksgiving turkey, though that flavor profile is greatly unlikely. As a serpent feeding almost primarily on the fossorial, they too hold on to this lifestyle. Slithering just beneath the wood scraps and construction debris is a cluster of, at maximum, 130 diadophus intertwined with one another. The ratio of males and females completely random with no correlation to anything else. Uncharacteristic for a snake, as they're largely thought solitary species, or at worst, aggressive territorialists. Any academic who gives Diadophus the time of day say it's likely a circumstance of thermoregulation. Clusters only form because many adults find one spot ideal and don't mind the company of others. To this notion, I would politely nod if it weren't for the unnecessary coldness of it. Do not mistake this as a plea for anthropomorphism. God forbid reptiles be anthropomorphized in the marketplace of herpetological discussion. But allow yourself to look at a different species of snake that shares a liking for communal gatherings. Garter snakes, another colubridae species, albeit one with a larger presence in herpetological studies of snake relations. On this matter, Snake Discovery mentions the following. They do form relationships even in the wild. It has been shown that wild garter snakes form such tight bonds with certain individuals that if their buddy dies, they might die from, I don't want to anthropomorphize them too much by saying depression, but they can pass away afterwards as a result of their buddy dying. Obviously, we can't peer into the minds of garter snakes and decode their relationships with one another for a semblance of sophistication or depth, or even be fully certain that the cause of deaths were reasonably correlated with their companions' deaths. But as far as evidence for this theorized social penchant goes, there is a similarly insufficient amount justifying the conclusion that communal species only commune for purposes of thermoregulation. As a herpetologist, zoologist, or dare I say, biologist, you should be acquainted with leaving all doors open. 
The vacancy of our conclusion only means there's more ecological wonder than what we have answers for. So, no, I don't think that snakes primarily commune for the purpose of thermoregulation. I do think that planting all of your eggs in that basket is closing your mind from considering this species as anything other than simple. I'm inclined to say that until there is sufficient evidence proving one way or the other, Diadophis, garter snakes, any social colubrid, is capable of forming bonds with one another, and that this is reason enough for their congregations. Though, don't let this dissuade you from conducting more research on the matter, of course, as this conclusion is in no way definitive. Diadophis punctatus carries a notably sized portfolio of names, hence my usage of their scientific name for clarity. In English, their names include the ringneck snake, key ringneck snake, coral belly ringneck snake, and regal ringneck snake. In Germany, they are called Heisbandsnatter, as well as Ringheisnatter. In Spanish, Colubre de Collar, or Colubre de Collar del Noroeste. Why must there be such an array of phrases describing one singular snake? Well, consider, please, that they occupy such a vast space throughout the North American continent, the name given by a calloused hand Floridian agricultural trimmer will, at the very least slightly, differ from one given by an unsuspecting southern Ontario Mennonite. From the humid brush of Baja California to the sparsely sunny corners of Quebec, Diadophis truly rules over North America in its variety of biomes. It is of course no surprise then, with this assorted disbursement, that their population numbers are judged as least concern. You and I are no stranger to taking whatever wins the IUCN red list may give us, but this isn't necessarily flawless. Grand Cayman, in the Caribbean, had its own Diadophis population, rumored to be exported straight from Florida, go figure, sprinkled throughout in 1991, and ever since, the local frog, lizard, worm, and small mammalian species have been invasively preyed upon. However, because they are allegedly so common, I strongly advise that any fellow residents of North America avoid handling this species. They are technically venomous, with them being what's called a rear fang species. Basically, in the back of their mouths are what they use to inject any prey with a venom more potent than that of your western hognose. Unless you're an individual experienced in the handling of hots, I advise you to, in the scenario you are obstructed by a diadophis, simply give her a respectful nod and carry on your merry way. They're not an aggressive species, but they're not one to be messed with either. That'll be all from me for today. I thank you for joining me on today's episode of Herb Corner. If you enjoyed the video, then don't forget to like, subscribe, or whatever you wish. Goodbye.